At the time of posting this, it's the 2020 Make It Rain event, running from October 21st to November 20th. If you've not been interested in the Gold Saucer, this event is a very good time to start. Maybe you don't realize all the options there are, all the games, and all the rewards there are to earn, even when there isn't an event going on. The Gold Saucer is a fantastic place of fantastic rewards, and it's a great time. To reach the Gold Saucer, you simply must progress the main story quest to 15 and complete the Gridanian, Uldan, or Luminsen Envoy. Afterwards, head to the Ulda Aetherite Plaza and walk out onto the main road. Here will be It Could Happen to You. Follow this quest to its conclusion to unlock the saucer in its entirety. This is also the general location of the NPC for the 2020 Make It Rain event. While doing the quest to unlock the saucer, be sure to pick up every Aetherite you pass by. Teleporting around is going to be something you do a lot. And the area is vertical too, with these water puddles to let you shoot up in a geyser. They try to make it extremely easy to get around this place, within reason. While exploring, pick up any and all blue quests you find to unlock further features of the saucer, and be sure to head upstairs using the elevator near the mini cactpaw area. I'm going to go through each thing one at a time and tell you about it, and maybe some strategies of how to win, where applicable. But before we actually even get into what we can do, let's look at the challenge log. This is a weekly log of objectives available to unlock in Limsa Lominsa's Adventurer's Guild, if you somehow skipped it. Even if you only do the saucer enough to fill this out every week, you'll gain tens of thousands of MGP per week. You'll get enough to buy anything you'd like to in no time especially because you'll be earning MGP like crazy. Just from completing the quest, you'll have been given some coupons for free plays on some games and some free MGP, the currency of the Gold Saucer. This stands for Mandeville Gold Saucer Points. There's basically no way to run out of MGP after this point, though there is technically a way, but it's harder to do than it is to earn MGP. And this way is by the minigames. Minigames have a low entry cost of 1 MGP, but potentially you can lose and win nothing. And there's a bunch of them to do. To start we have the Moogle's Paw. These are kind of like those rigged crane games. Move the Moogle over the orbs to pick them up. Aim the legs, not the Moogle. You have to hold the buttons to move the Moogle, not just single clicks. Single clicks will just cause you to lose immediately. The rewards are 25 MGP for the small balls and 10 MGP for the big balls. Next is Cuffaker, also known as punch -a greg The goal of this is to time the bar as close to the absolute center of the gauge as close as you can. The window for a perfect click is extremely tiny and the reward is up to only 25 MGP for the best hit. Monster Toss is a longer version of Cuffaker, essentially. You have 30 seconds to hit the button between the zone as many times as you can. Up to 5 baskets can get you 50 MGP per game. But given it takes so much longer than Punch -a Greg, it's inferior if you're good at it. Crystal Tower Striker has the same payout for a slightly different version of the bar mini game of Punch -a Greg. Instead of quickly filling and emptying, the moment the bar hits the max, it empties completely. But once again, just time the bar as close to the goal as you can to get a nice payout. The best minigames, and the potentially most profitable, are upstairs near the Lloyd of a Minion area. The Finer Miner, and Out on a Limb. Both of them have the same basic premise. To start, you are given a difficulty select. The Cactar is easy mode with the largest area, yellow zone with the more wolf of medium, and hard is Tetis. I mean Titan. On the Finer Miner, this determines the number of attempts you get. The Finer Miner has a circle that fills and shrinks while a minute long timer goes down. 
you have a measly six hits per attempt on easy mode to find the invisible hit zone. Only four on hard. When you do, you will take either a small chunk, medium chunk, or completely deplete the bar with how close you get to the perfect zone. If you succeed, you will be given the opportunity to double down. If you accept, you will be once again given six attempts to find a zone and deplete the bar. However, you also had a minute long timer during all this. The timer does not replenish when doubling down. So if you took 40 seconds to properly time and find the first zone, you will only have 20 seconds to do it again with a brand new place to find. I do not like the finer miner. I do out on a limb instead as you have 10 chances and the bar is much easier to eyeball. You have a fan shape that the pointer runs back and forth across. It's the exact same principle but way easier to do. And at least on easy and medium difficulty, more profitable. Hard mode, finer minor seems to be better but of uh, good luck with only 4 attempts per swing. And for the record, out on a limb's difficulty is the speed of the cursor instead of number of attempts. Sonic must be extremely jealous right about now. But anyway, back on doubling down, the first double down you do will not increase the reward by that much. But after a few successful runs, you'll get a huge boost. If you get really good at this, hats off to you. This can be a huge amount of MGP if you feel like doing it forever and ever between gates, which we'll go over those later. And fun fact, this was apparently 1.0 gathering. Aren't you glad this is just a side game now? I am. But that covers all of the mini games as far as the definition the game gives, but there's lots more to do. To start we have one of the more major attractions of the saucer, the mini cactpot. This is around the prize counter and you can do this every day. It resets at the normal daily reset time and you can buy three tickets per day. These are simple scratch offs numbered one to nine. The goal is to pick a row of three numbers that will be added up together. You begin with one number revealed and can scratch away three additional slots to reveal four numbers total. When you pick a row, column, or diagonal to add up together. So if you pick the row with 1, 2, and 3 in it, it does 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. For a mini cactpot, the reward is 10,000 MGP for a mini cactpot. And that's per ticket. But no ticket is guaranteed to win big. The numbers are randomly spread, so some tickets are better than others. But no matter what, the goal should, for every ticket, be to make a Y shape. This will ultimately reveal every possible choice for getting a cactpot. If there is a 2 in the bottom middle and a 3 in the top right, there is no way to get a 1, 2, 3. But if you only reveal a 2 in the bottom middle, you know that the only possible choice to get a 1, 2, 3 will be to pick the bottom row and hope it contains both the 1 and the 3 you could wind up earning the biggest reward, or the smallest with this strat. A backup strategy is that if you cannot get the 1, 2, 3 guaranteed, go for the 7, 8, 9. 7, 8, 9 is the second best payout. If you can't get either, uh, enjoy whatever you get. The good news is, there is no way to lose. You'll always get some kind of profit, even if it's tiny. But this is the mini cactpot. There's also the weekly jumbo cactpot. Once again, you can buy three tickets, but this is a weekly lottery. You pick a four digit number from 0000 to 9999 and hope that number gets drawn. Every week, the winning number is chosen at random and announced live. Often, many players will turn out just for the show and also for the early bird bonus. If you show up within the first hour or so of the drawing, you will get a bonus on your MGP payout. While you're very unlikely to get the cactpot, it can happen and every bonus is worth it.
but even if the consolation prize, it's worth huge profits. The drawing itself takes place every Saturday on its own timer. At the moment, it would be at 10 p.m. Eastern, listed within the Cactpot window. Before we go on, let's talk about the Gold Saucer menu in the Character Menu tab. This is great for a quick overview of the going-ons of the saucer and whether or not you've done your Cactpot turn-ins, or if there's tournaments going on, and so much more. This is basically in the menu containing all big things of the saucer. But before we move on to those big games, let's take one last detour to talk about the fashion report. This is both on the normal weekly reset and its own weekly timer. The weekly reset is every Tuesday. When you wake up Tuesday morning, you can come over to Masked Rose here and ask him to see the week's prompt. There will be a theme name and four hints for four specific pieces. For example, we have the Creator. This means Alexander the Creator, the third raid tier of the Alexander raid series. My mages happen to use a mix of the Creator set and the Shire gear for their glam. So I not only matched the hint, I basically perfected it as noted by this gold medal. Smitten with mittens is any kind of mitten basically. Jewels of blue, any type of blue earring. And Tales from Genji, the Genji top from the Delta Scape raids. All of the other pieces can be basically anything you want, as long as it has the correct dye color of the week. Not only does the piece matter, but dyes give bonus points. For most of the gear, black is the correct dye color for this prompt. But there is no obvious way to know this without testing manually, or using outside resources. And even then, you'll need the latter as you only get four attempts a week. So if you want to try out every dye type, uh, good luck when there's like a hundred dye colors. A general color is plus one point, but the specific shade is a two-point bonus per correct die. But that's just for this week's prompt. Every prompt is different. Every piece, every die, can be different based on the prompt given. Come back on Friday or later to be judged on your outfit and get your payout. The rewards are very much worth it. In this attempt, I got 78 points. This is considered a failure. A failure that is still worth 10,000 MGP. That's right, 10,000 MGP just for participating. However, if I make the very, very small effort to grab a blue earring, I can get a score of 80 or higher. Hitting that threshold will give you a bonus 50,000 MGP for the week. That's 60,000 MGP every week for what is often extremely easy to get. But the rewards don't stop there. If you aim for a 100 plus score, you'll get an achievement and a title for this feat, but only the first time. You may want to do it a few times though, as there's a special shop here next to Masked Rose here that expands based on your total scoring. I believe the maxed rank of this store is unlocked at 500 total points. But even if you only go for the 100 score once, you'll eventually unlock the full store just by doing this weekly. Especially if you go for the 80s. You'll need 7 weeks at most to unlock the full thing. This is made all the more easier by the wonderful Kyoko Star. She does infographics just about every week of what items you need for gold ranks, and the easiest way to get 100 or 80 points. She's built up her own little community on this one activity, and even has a Discord too. I have linked her Twitter in the description, and you can go from there. She also has this neat Make It Rain MGP Profit Cheat Sheet. Use this for determining what you want to do to earn MGP during this event. And as you can see from this, there's plenty to do between the small and the large. This is where gates come in. 
There's a ton of these. They happen every 20 minutes on the dot, and there's NPCs all over the place that will instantly teleport you to the gate's location. And the events we have to play are varied in themselves. To start, we have Leap of Faith with its own special instance. This is a test of your platforming skills, which may not be all too great. If you need practice, try the Kugane Tower in Stormblood. Platform your way up to the goal and collect Cactar statues along the way for bonus MGP. The basic path up to the end is pretty easy to do no matter what pattern you get, as the map has several different layouts. The bronze and silver cactars are also not that far out of the way either, but the gold cactar is always in a hard to reach challenge section, but there's an achievement tied to them, so you gotta go for it. It's also worth a good chunk of MGP. Also, those of you height adverse, when you see it's the floating city of Nim, you may want to nope right out of there. I've seen a lot of people have problems with the fall distance, as you can see here. And then he gets sent back to the start. But the fall in itself may be a problem for you, and a reason to avoid this event. But we also have Cliffhanger, which is a much lighter version of the platforming challenge. They aren't instanced and involve you dodging bombs with a short trip up to the top. The bombs can even be used to your advantage if you know how to do it. Next up, Air Force One. This is also instanced as it has you flying around the saucer shooting targets. It's a rail shooter. Don't shoot the bombs. Be quick and aim fast, but don't be too fast because bombs can often spawn around or over the normal targets. The ultimate goal is to hit 5,000 points, which is a perfect run. This seems high, but they throw enough high point worth targets that this isn't all that bad. Remember, quick but consistent, but not overly quick. Oh, and there's multiple layouts for this too, so don't get used to just one pattern. Finally, we have a pair of games on the main stage. These are my favorites. The first is Funga, or Any Way the Wind Blows. This is a game of luck, but also probability. Typhon will randomly Funga the arena five times in specific different AoE patterns. There's safe spots to the north and south on the butterfly wings that maximize your chances, but don't guarantee a win. Watch as I win here, just for placing my feet very specifically on the bump here. Oh, and you may want to pick a glam that lets you do this. Seeing your feet helps a bit for this. Be lucky enough to not get hit, and you'll earn a big MGP prize. But even more fun is the slice is right. This is you against Yojimbo, who will slice pillars of bamboo that rise out of the ground. Avoid where they fall to win. Also, don't stand where they rise up, or you'll be kicked off from that alone. But the game starts slow. He'll cut one bamboo piece, then a few rounds of just two, then upgrade to a further three pieces, and finish with a massive four pieces of bamboo. Each bamboo piece can break one of three ways. Bisected, which creates a line AoE in both directions, a diagonal cut, which will cause the pillar to fall in a single direction, and diced bamboo. The diced pattern makes a large circle AoE around the pillar. But the game is broken up into three rounds and two intermission rounds between. Each individual round rewards MGP, so even if you lose, making it partway is still worth a lot of MGP. Of course, the further you get, the better. Round 1 will end after a few pairs of bamboo, then go into the first intermission. Daigoro will be summoned and four MGP piles will be strewn about the arena. Each is worth 1000 MGP, but Daigoro is going to leap and pick up each pile. If you're near his landing spot, you will get knocked out. Round 2 ends after a few three bamboo patterns. The second intermission is all luck. Three cups will be shuffled, 
one with Daigoro who will eliminate you, one that doubles your MGP payout, and one that does nothing. There is no pattern to this. The shuffle is the same every run up until the impossible to follow spin. Just take a guess and hope for the best. Your reward is the extremely hard round three, with mostly four bamboo tower patterns. Survive a few of those and you'll get the full win. A few tips. Get used to watching for how the bamboo gets cut. Each has a noticeable shine around the bamboo of how the cut came to be, even before the half animation of the bamboo falling apart. Bisections are the most obvious since the shine across the bit of the ground. Further, stick to the edges and between the towers until it's just four bamboo. Even on the three bamboo patterns, if the bamboo on the left and right are both cut to be circle AoEs, you can still dodge the circles at the edge. But once you get to four pillars, stands more towards the middle, because if both are circles again, the edge is no longer safe. You have to get far away and still dodge the last two bamboo, whatever they may be. Oh, and don't bother with the MGP from the Daigoro phase. Winning is more profitable than the 1000 MGP per pile. Pick one possible pile, and if he faces towards it, get away immediately. Alright, let's get into the big, big games. The first is behind the prize counter. We have Triple Triad. FF8 fans around the world collectively cheer at this. For those who don't know what Triple Triad is though, it's simple. You build a deck of five cards, each with a rarity and four numbers on them. Each number correlates to a side of the card, the top number the top of the card, etc, etc. You then take turns placing cards on a 3x3 grid with the goal of turning the opponent's cards your color. To do that, you simply match bigger numbers to smaller numbers. An 8 to the right beats anything 7 or below on the left of another card. Have more cards than your opponent at the end of a match, and you win. Win, lose, or draw, you'll get some MGP, less than what you paid for it if not a win. But additionally with a win, you'll have a chance to get a card drop. When first finding a triple triad NPC marked with a card icon above their head, it will have an exclamation mark in it. Beating the NPC will turn it into a star icon. This star means you have beaten them, but not earned all of their available cards. Each NPC can have different card drops specific to just them. One often much rarer than any of the other cards they may hold. If you're a collector, this is a really good way to track who has what left without using an outside tracker. But you may still want to use one. You can buy cards at the prize desk, clearing dungeons, trials, and raids, but most cards will be won from beating NPCs, and you will want to collect cards for at least a little bit. At around 60 cards, your deck will be upgraded to the highest rank, which allows you to slot in the most powerful cards you can. You can slot in one 4 or 5 star card, and four 3 star cards. If you want to play Triple Triad seriously on your own time and pace, you'll still want to at least collect a minimum number of cards just to get the deck restrictions minimized. Also, NPCs never have to follow this rule. They can have multiple rare cards in a single deck and use them every single time. But things aren't always so simple either. There's additional rules to Triple Triad. These can differ on region and specific NPC. They are as follows. Order, where you must place cards in the order of the deck slots rather than any order you wish. Chaos, card order is randomized. Random, your deck is randomly chosen across all cards you have. You can end up with a deck of all five stars or all one stars. All open. Normally the opponent's cards are all hidden from you. All open makes them visible to you. 
three open, the same as all open, but three random cards. You don't know which three cards you have shown to your opponent, as far as I can tell. Reverse. Lower numbers now be larger numbers. Fallen Ace. Ace, where A on a card is basically a 10. Fallen Ace makes it that one can be an Ace. If comboed with Reverse Rule, Ace now beats one. Ascension and Descension. Certain cards come with certain affinities, with a symbol in the top right corner to note this affinity. For example, all Garleans come with the Garlean affinity. Ascension and Descension will change the value of each card by one for every card of that type placed down. So if we place down a Garlean card with all fives, after the turn has played out, the card will automatically upgrade or downgrade by one. Multiple cards can cause multiple stacks of this bonus to be applied. So if you put four cards down, that brings a 5 all the way up to a 9. Further, cards max out at Ace and 1. There are no such thing as 11s or zeros. Swap. You will swap one card at random with your opponent for the duration of the match only. Same. If you place a card down adjacent to multiple cards, and if multiple sides match the numbers, you will capture all cards with the same numbers. For example, if your card has a 7 to the left and the opponent's card a 7 to the right, while at the same time the top of your card has an 8 and the card above is an 8 on the bottom. Plus, similar to same, but with addition, if you place down a card and the above adds up to 13 and to the left adds up to 13, you will flip the cards. Sudden Death Ties no longer end the game. You cannot draw. You will return all cards of your color to your deck. This includes any captured cards, so you could end up swapping half of your decks for the duration of the second round. Roulette. This will turn into any possible rule at the start of a match. You won't know the rule until the match begins. It could be reverse against your normal deck of high numbers. The MGP rewards are tiny on their own. Even in the big payouts, they're smaller than what you could get faster from just mini games. When you consider all of the above rules, it can be very hard to win against certain NPCs. However, there are tournaments and that's where the big payouts are. Tournaments have specific rule sets and limited number of matches you're allowed to play towards the tournament. You may only proceed tournaments through the Triple Triad Battle Hall. This is located in the Duty Finder and puts you into a special instance specifically for Triple Triad matches. There are a couple of NPCs here to win cards against or do your tournament matches against. You have little to no hope of winning a Triple Triad tournament using just the NPCs as the number of points they give is pretty low but even just placing will give you big rewards worth going for. Otherwise, set yourself up to face against other players to try and place high, or even win. And don't worry, even if you don't want to do tournaments, you can still play against your friends in main towns, or even houses if you place down a triple triad furniture piece. You can even set the rules in a friendly match. For some tips on how to handle Triple Triad, the big advice is having multiple decks. Have your normal tried and true deck to start, pick the 5 star card of your choice and 3 star cards with pairs of 8 as corners. For example, Thordin is my 5 star card of choice, and then I have Ysail, Hilda, Griffin, and Lucia each cover a different corner. They are all also specifically lacking any affinity. All of them are generic, so they can't be affected by ascension, or more importantly, descension. And due to the huge number of eights, you can make heavy use of plus and same. But so can your opponents. It's a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none kind of deck. 
great for scouting out NPCs for the first few matches, then you can make a deck specifically to counter them. I also recommend making a deck specifically to counter NPCs with Reverse and Ascension. Otherwise, feel free to experiment with the other two deck slots. Maybe make a plus or same deck. A second Ascension deck might also be a good call. My Primal Ascension deck might break against someone else using a Primal Ascension deck, so I can pull out Garlean Ascension to beat them. Also, if you're planning to collect all the cards, grab a tracker. There's a lot of different trackers online, and everyone has their own preference of tracker. I've seen mixed opinions, and a quick Google search will bring up a bunch of them to choose from. You can also sell any extra cards you get for a bit of MGP. The higher the rarity of the card, the more MGP you get back. Alright, let's move on to a bit of an awkward one. Lord of Verminion. This is a bit of a real-time strategy with rock, paper, scissors mechanics. Starcraft, but way simpler. Every minion you can collect has stats connected to them. Head into your Gold Saucer Menus for Minion tab and click Edit Hotbar. Here you can see all of the minions you have, their stats, their skills, and etc. And the position of them within the Trinity. The goal of the game is simple. Break all three of the opponent's crystals by sending your minions into their zones. But they can fight back. You'll have to defeat their minions and protect your own base. You can also disrupt their play by sending minions to destroy their shields and sight, or even stopping their base from producing minions for a period of time. But beyond this, it's a very complex game, one I do not understand nor enjoy. If nothing else, do the solo missions for the rewards, and maybe participate in the tournaments. Once again, the tournaments will be the best source of MGP in this game, but if you like this kind of game, you may enjoy it far more than I do. I know this is a short section, but I genuinely do not like this game, so it's hard to advise beyond the idea of collect a lot of minions so you have the options. Also, be sure to bring counters to everything you can. You're given a lot of hot bar slots for a reason. Oh, and most people tend to agree with this as... Lord of Emanion is kind of dead on the player end. Though it may see a boost in play account thanks to Make It Rain. But next up is something I genuinely do enjoy and invested a lot of time into. Chocobo Racing. This has the most time to get into, but also potentially some nice and easy profits once you've gotten to the end game. But you're gonna have to start small, a win at the start is only 400 MGP with less rewards for each position below first. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Going back and forth between Bent Branch Meadows will occur quite a bit with this game. Even to start with the adoption of your first bird, you'll need to head to Brent Branch. But there is no difference between a male and female bird when it comes to the actual racing so pick either one. Then head back, register it, give it a name, and get racing. The tutorial does a pretty good job of explaining things, and showing how janky this is. Everything has this weird bit of extra lag to every action you do. Your hitbox is even laggy. Sometimes it feels like your hitbox is in front of your bird for collecting chests and such, other times it's at the base of the neck. It takes a bit to get used to, but eventually it will click. Everything will still feel laggy though. That never changes, be it solo or with other player racers. Which, if it wasn't clear, chocobo cues are extremely fast at 30 seconds at most. This is so you don't wait forever for other players but you still have a chance to have to race against more people. You'll get EXP bonuses for it too, and you can tell who is a player and who is an NPC at a quick glance. With unchanged color filters, 
NPCs are green and players are blue. And you'll even be able to talk to them in party chat. And if nothing else, you can race against friends with the party option, but for no rewards. Getting randoms isn't so simple since races are broken up into three tracks and a huge number of subsets. The intro races are from rating 1 to 20, which is nothing. But this is a good excuse to go into your gold saucer window and check out our chocobo. That's a lot of windows that make no sense whatsoever, but some of it does make some obvious sense. There's a listed rating for your chocobo, which dictates what race tier you are in, and this is based on your stats. The more stats you have, the higher your rating. Leveling up by racing will automatically up your stats, but you also have a training session count, which allows you to train specific stats. You can easily buy training food with gil or MGP. I recommend not trying to invest too heavily early on. Both the gil and MGP costs are relatively high, at least until you've earned a lot of gil or MGP you can afford to spend. Worry about this more at the end game of racing rather than early on. Something you definitely do want to invest in though is skills. They are no less expensive, but stuff like Choco Cure is going to be a godsend. You can give your Chocobo one skill this way, but it is so worth it. And as such, when challenges start unlocking at rating 41 plus, do all of those at some point. Maybe after getting to a high rating so the lower level ones are pretty easy. The reason to do this is, there are some actions locked behind these challenges. The shop expands with further completion. And this is especially important because... Chocobo racing is a press W to win kind of game most of the time. Sigoli Road is the absolute shortest of the three courses, the easiest to win, and requires the least amount of effort. As long as you meet the minimum amount of stamina to reach your top speed, the lather debuff doesn't even come into play. Just hold W and hit the finish line just as your stamina runs out, provided no items get in the way. We got some Mario Kart up in here with a whole slew of items. The most dangerous changes based on your strategy and how close you are to the other racers. Personally, Bacchus Wine and Choco Meteor I by far the worst items to be the victim of. That second one is by far more dangerous than anything else. Huge stamina loss, speed cut in like half, and it lasts for a very long time. If your strategy revolves around stamina, this is deadly. Problem is, it only works in one direction. All players ahead of the user get hit. So if you somehow get Choco Media while in first place, it's not going to do anything. But the biggest and most important window is the Pedigree window. This is a measure of your Chocobo's potential. Pedigree is a measure of 1 to 9, meaning you'll at least go through 9 generations of Chocobos to the max rank. The star ratings are inherited from the parents and is key to getting the ultimate bird. The own section helps determine the absolute maximum a stat can be. A pedigree 9 with a 4 star stat can have a max of 500 in that stat. 3 stars, only 460. The parentage section is for when you eventually retire your bird at rank 40 or higher to breed a new racing chocobo. This is something you definitely want to do, since higher pedigrees means higher rankings means more MGP payout. The process of breeding takes a whole 30 minutes of sitting around waiting for the deed to be done, but based on the two parentage windows, both the own and parentage stats of the new chocobo will be determined. And you will want to start building up a good racer sooner rather than later. Possibly even raising both male and female chocobos just to control your output. A pedigree 9 chocobo with 20 stars is the ultimate goal I would say. A win at the highest strengths 
for a race less than 2 minutes long is 1,000 MGP. But that's winning. There's 7 other races, and you might have to fight other players for that clear. And even with an ultimate bird, you might still lose because of the actions of the AI. Choco Media sends its regards. Attached in the description is a Choco Racing Guide that goes in-depth into breeding and what you should aim for when you get to Pedigree 9. This resource was extremely useful to me when I was grinding out Chocobo Racing Completion. And finally, the last big minigame is Domen Mahjong. No, not the tile matching game you played on Windows 97. This is the Poke game. This is probably the singular most complex game in all of the Golden Saucer, and the one that gives the least rewards. Due to gambling laws, the only MGP payout you can earn with this is from the challenge log, entirely unrelated to your performance. But the game is fun, if you're not a moron like me, or you have the time to invest. An average match will take an hour, if you even get a game going, likely due to the time investment, or people are dumb dumbs like me, Domen Mahjong also tends to not have many players. Though there is a small community for it, similar to Revival Wings for PvP. But as to what to do for Mahjong, it's better known as Rishi Mahjong. Sorry if I butchered that. But how it works is similar to poker, as I said. Your goal is to make a hand of 14 tiles that fit specific conditions. You can have one condition met, or multiple. These conditions are called Yaku. A hand can only win with at least one Yaku. Each Yaku has specific point values as well. You draw one tile every turn, then discard back down to 13 tiles to end your turn. But if a discarded tile is one an opponent needs, they can take the tile for themselves. As long as you do not make a move like this, you are considered closed hand, which comes with point bonuses. If you take a tile your opponent discards, or otherwise announce the state of your hand at any point, your hand will become open. Further, there are super special hand types called Yakuman. For example, the 14 orphans, which requires one of every single tile type. And this is just all the beginning of describing Mahjong. When first starting Mahjong when it came out, I studied hours to even get a basic grasp of the game. I quickly gave up both because I felt like I was bad at it, and my luck was never on my side. Many times did I become one tile away from winning, and never got that last tile I could need. Unlike Lord of a Minion, if you can get the matches and the people to play, I do highly recommend it if this is your thing. It just isn't mine because I'm dumb. And grab a real guide, or a friend who knows how to play Mahjong. It's not easy. That's all of the events and big games, but what about all the rewards? We have minions, mounts, glamour items including an invisible shield, orchestrian rolls. I'm showing off some of these rewards now, but keep an eye on the prices. The absolute most expensive item is the Sabatender mount for 2 million MGP. It's very much achievable, but don't burn yourself out trying to grind it all at once. Even if we have a month long event, Take it at your own pace. You may have noticed that my MGP is very high. There's basically nothing left for me to buy until they add new stuff. Time solves all issues you might have with earning prizes. But that covers everything within the gold saucer that normally happens. But there's events too. For example, the Yokai event always takes place within the saucer, or at least the trade-in rewards are. 
but I mentioned multiple times the Make It Rain event. In addition to a small quest chain for an emote and some free MGP, all MGP rewards that aren't from the challenge log are increased by 50%. So that 60,000 MGP from Fashion Report will become 90,000 MGP. And because this year's event is 4 weeks long, that's 3,600 MGP just from the Fashion Report. This event isn't usually this long, but even when it's only the normal two weeks, that's still huge bonuses. Further, there's an FC buff and personal FC buff item that you can get from Grand Company Squadrons that stacks with this 50% bonus from the event. So spend any amount of time here during the event and you'll be able to get any specific reward you could want by the end of the event. There's also a special event NPC with its own shop, including the housing items that are the mini games such as Punch of Greg. You can put these in and even play them within your own house. There's much more too, but you'll have to come back to the shop next time there's a yearly Make It Rain event to see what's there. You may even find something brand new to that year's event. So come on down to the Gold Saucer and have fun that only a Mandeville man, woman, child, potato, dragon girl, cat girl, whatever you are, can. Thanks for watching this overview on the Golden Saucer. I hope this helped you discover just how much there is to do in the saucer. Even the stuff I don't like is there and is able to be enjoyed by the right audience. Just because I'm not a fan of Verminion doesn't mean it doesn't have its defenders. And it doesn't take grinding to get you big rewards. Take it slow and steady and you'll see all the items you could buy and much more. But take care and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Bubba Lau, Kathy Nock, Lemon, Meowfie, and Nick. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down below in the description. Thanks for watching.